Can dreams come true? Not this one. And I'll tell you why, this week on Motor 2005. SN's Motoring 2005 is brought to you by Quaker State Motor Oil, oils fine-tuned for different engines, and Midas, Total Car Care, we do that. We're in our 18th year on TSN, and while the vehicles have changed over the years, one thing has always remained the same. Wherever we go, the first question always is, What's your favorite vehicle? Well, my answer, like the question, has also remained the same. Money, no object, hands down, it's the BMW M5, the king of sedans. Why? Well, briefly, it's a joy to drive, and the styling is understated. You wouldn't even notice it in a parking lot, which is the way I like it, but it's a style that would stand the test of time. And oh, yes, the color has to be black, like that 92 M5 I almost bought. Something about a lack of money got in the way. Anyway, as you know, BMW has introduced its latest version of the M5. So let's set back and check it out. The M5 is an all new developed car, and uh, especially the heart of it, so you could say the engine and the gearbox are our big innovations. We have a totally new V10 engine and a seven-speed sequential gearbox. In the end, we have 507 horsepower in the car out of five liters of displacement. The SMG transmission itself uh, can be set in 11 different modes, um, a little slower shifting, a little quicker shifting, and, and the ultimate in quick shifting by turning the DSC button off and uh, putting it in launch control mode uh, to get those perfect race starts uh, if the conditions are, are appropriate for it. The power button, what it does is um, it will limit the uh, throttle butterfly openings so that when you initially start the car, unless you hit that power button, you're at 400 horsepower. So if you're just uh, driving around town, you don't necessarily need all 507 horsepower, uh, you can drive with 400 horsepower, uh, which the current M5 comes with. Uh, but when you hit that power button, you have the full effect of that V10 engine. Whoever said money can't buy happiness hasn't driven one of these. I mean, that is just a whole lot more fun than you're allowed to have your clothes on. Huh? When you leave the line with this thing, the launch control, of course, is the trick, but there is just so much grip, and then the, the torque is wonderful, uh, and the shifts, the whole darn thing. We got 268 when the governor cut in, and then just hold on for a while and nail the brakes, and again, impressive is the, is the key phrase there. You can, you can literally have to put your eyes back in your eyeball sockets at the end. It's the fastest, most powerful of its kind ever built. It, in fact, is tremendously fast. It almost scares even among the more experienced among, amongst us. Um, however, it, it somewhat has an enigmatic personality. It's almost too futuristic, too high-tech, that the poor driver sometimes has a hard time figuring out exactly how the car should handle, what the car's doing. It, there is, it doesn't respond to the driver very well, I don't think. Um, the best way, to, I believe, to, in order to drive it and enjoy the car is to use as much of the manual functions as possible. On balance, it is still the best of the breed yet. If the engine is a revolutionary step forward, it's definitely evolutionary in the chassis suspension. It's nice, doesn't roll much, it's got lots of grip. Despite its 50-50 uh, weight distribution, there's still a bit of plowing on the front end. Now, when I tell you it plows the front end a little bit, that's, that's at speeds that most other cars can't even begin to attain. But uh, it's the engine that dominates this car. The thing that really fascinated me was two statistics. The first one, the computer power that's on board the car, they do between them 
200 million calculations a second and it needs every single one of those bits of data to function the way it does. The other thing is the speed of the pistons. They go up and down at 20 meters per second which is very, very quick. To put that into perspective, if you look at the Williams F1 engine, it goes up and down at about 25 meters per second. The difference is the BMW M5 is designed to last a lifetime, the F1 engine about 800 kilometers. So it tells you the refinement and the stuff they built into that engine. I think it's just going to be a spectacular car when it finally hits the roads and it's going to be a very special test ride. Does the word crossover imply an uh, alternate lifestyle? Well, maybe it does. More later on Kenzie's Corner. This has to be one of the most anticipated new vehicle launches in a long time. And it doesn't disappoint. This week, the 05 Corvette. The latest Corvette is a smaller car being closer in size to the Porsche 911 than the outgoing C5. The good news is that in spite of being 130 millimeters shorter and 28 millimeters narrower, the longer wheelbase brings better balance to the handling and a more nimble feel to it than the previous car. Indeed, the new VET simply devoured the pylon course. When Chevrolet redesigned the 05 VET interior, they did a bang up number. Better materials, better fit and finish, nicer instrumentation and much better ergonomics. In short, it's better in every way. You also get a more comfortable seat with a power adjustment for just about everything as well as lumbar support. But there is one problem. You have to manually recline the seat back. Not only is that completely out of step with the rest of the car, when the doors shut, well, it's a real pain in the ass. The Z51 Performance Package takes the coupe's handling prowess to roughly the same level as the acclaimed Z06. More aggressive dampers and springs, larger stabilizer bars and larger cross-drill brake rotors bring a much crisper feel and shorter stopping distances. There's also a slightly different version of the manual box. The revised ratios are taller and so place more of an emphasis on performance than the base transmission. To get in and drive this Corvette away, all you've got to do is have this remote control in your pocket or in your handbag, and you can do everything without ever putting a single key in any slot. But what happens if the battery on the Corvette goes south and doesn't obey this thing? Well, there actually is a key, and there's only one place that it fits, right here. That allows you to open the tailgate, which then allows you to pop the door which gives you access to the cabin to pop the hood, which then allows you to gain access to the battery so you can boost the car. And hopefully that's the end of your problem. In the dry, the Corvette will pull a full G when pushed to the limit, which is world class. Aside from the suspension upgrades, it's the massive Goodyear run flat tires. P245 40 ZR18s up front and 285 35 ZR19s in back. Now they stick to the tarmac with a tenacity usually reserved for much more expensive automobiles. Think Porsche or Ferrari. You'd be wrong to think of this Corvette as a $70,000 car. It's not. It's $75,000 plus, of course, the government's bit. The reason being, while these run flat tires are exceptionally good on worn dry tarmac, the instant the temperature drops down to below about 10 degrees, well, they turn into hockey pucks. And hockey pucks, well, they're designed to slide, and that's exactly what happens to the Corvette. The bottom line, if you want to keep your wheels in one piece, you better invest in winter tires and a set of rims. The VET's new 6-liter engine is true to its predecessors as it still uses overhead valves and pushrods. However, when compared to the outgoing 5.7-liter lump, it's the model of refinement. To begin with, it now dishes out a tire shredding 400 horsepower and 400 pounds-feet of torque. In spite of this and its aggressive cam, this motor is smooth and displays a level of civility and ease of drive I did not expect. 
There's also enough poop to warp the C6 to a metric tonne in just 4.2 seconds when mated to that Z51 box. When you look in the rear view mirror, there's quite a distortion in the back glass. However, that's not the biggest irritant with this new VET. That distinction, well, it belongs to the six-speed manual transmission. Quite simply, in order to prove to the government that GM's doing something about fuel economy in the Corvette, now there's an oxymoron for you if you want one, they actually force you to shift from first to fourth gear. Well, the only way to override it is stand on the gas, which is exactly what I did, which overrides any fuel economy benefit. You know, the government's got no business in our bedroom, and they've got no business in the Corvette transmission either. Finally, the brakes do a wonderful job of hauling the VET down from the outrageous speeds it tends to see. Repeated stops saw the pedal remain as crisp and fade-free as it did from the beginning. The other item worthy of note is an excellent electronic stability control system. It too is world class. Along with the usual modes is one called competition. When engaged, it allows the driver to chuck the rear end out before it steps in and rains on a really wonderful parade. You know, this new Corvette is a fantastic car. It's more comfortable, it's got a ton of power, and it handles like the Dickens. Indeed, if GM could distill the essence of this new Corvette and put just one little drop in all the other devils they produce, we'd be pretty darn close to heaven. Time to update our long-term Malibu Max. You know, General Motors has been criticized over the years for its lack of inspiration when it comes to styling, and I won't even mention the Aztec. But to GM's credit, this Malibu Max does have an edgy style to it, so much so that it turns heads on a regular basis. And the vehicle has been a real treat to drive. Now I do have a pet peeve. I like hatchbacks and most hatchbacks come with a flexible canvas cover that you can pull back and cover your belongings. But with the Max, it's a hard cover. Now you do have two different heights, but the bottom line is, is once you get it in, you're restricted to stuff that only goes this high. More trouble than it should be. Our Midas tip of the week concerns winter visibility. Even if you've got a good set of summer wiper blades on your vehicle, you can probably do better in terms of winter performance with a set of these winter blades. They've got a, a jacket of rubber coating the entire structure of the blade so they don't clog with ice and snow. Now don't discard your summer blades. Even if the rubber's in bad condition, buy a couple of new rubber refills. We showed you how to install those refills previously in this season. Buy the refills from the dealership, install them over the winter, and have them on hand to put back on next spring. Next fall, change out your blades again and put your winters on. You've got the best of both worlds. I don't like the look of these blades, but they sure do perform well in the winter. I'm sure you've all been in the situation or seen other motorists having to reach out and snap the driver's wiper blade up when it gets to the top of its travel because they literally can't see where they're going in a driving snowstorm. Another thing that'll really help is premium washer fluid. And usually the color denotes the fact that it's a premium fluid. You can see the color of this one gives you much better performance at low temperatures and you can actually clear a light layer of frost off the windshield without waiting for the defrost heat to get to the windshield first thing in the morning. That's your Midas tip of the week. You know, as Jim Kenzie likes to say, there are three kinds of lies. Lies, damn lies, and statistics. Well, there's one we should all be paying attention to. A statistic, that is, especially mom and dad. Did you know that 90% of all child safety seats are not properly installed? How do you do it? Well, to find an answer, we dropped into an Audi dealership in Oakville, Ontario. Why a dealership? Well, at this one, the staff is taught not only about the product, but also about consumer relations. Chris Sue is the business manager, and he recently finished a course on how to properly install a child safety seat. Very proud father of uh, two young boys aged five and three, uh, and obviously very concerned about their safety. Uh, and so our certification manager suggested that I take the SitSafe program, which is designed to 
tell parents, uh, whether new, old, or you know, halfway through, about how to properly restrain their children in a vehicle. What I'm doing right now is I'm installing the top tether anchor into the uh, back of the vehicle. And since September 2002, all vehicles were required by law to have these tether anchors installed. Okay, so what I'm gonna do now is I'm just gonna pull tight on the top tether to make sure it's nice and snug. And then down here, I'm just gonna attach the latch anchor. It just clips right into the anchorage point here. And then there's a similar one on the other side. And what I'm gonna do now is just pull tight on it. And this is the, this is the most difficult part of any child in seat installation is just actually putting all your weight on the seat and pulling up on the strap to make sure that everything is nice and tight. And to check, there shouldn't be more than about half an inch of movement side to side down here or forward to back. Just gonna use Tigger here as to demonstrate how to properly buckle a child into the seat. And this is a five point harness. And a couple things you wanna make sure is that they are, the chest clip is done up properly and that the belts are all nice and flat and are not twisted. And the chest clip here should be right at armpit level. And you'll notice that the belts are nice and tight and you cannot pinch the webbing very much. That's proper insulation for a forward facing child restraint system. Each year, uh, there, there's a great number of children who are fatally injured or seriously injured um, in vehicle collisions. And these are things that are obviously preventable with just the right education and with the right tools to show people how to properly install and do their car seats. You're squeezing my stomach. I mentioned off the top of the program that my dream car is the BMW M5. But how about our man in the Quaker State Garage, Bill Gardner? And I know it's going to be a pickup truck, but Bill, money no object, what would be in your driveway? Well, Brad, it'd be a three-quarter ton GM two-wheel drive pickup with a crew cab, so that's four full doors and an eight-foot box, because there's no such thing as having too much room in your pickup truck. Now, that's a big, long truck. That's a truck that you've got to back in everywhere you want to park it. But on the highway, beautiful driving machine and all kinds of room for lots of gear and then some. Uh, I want to talk this week about the great strides that have been made in terms of utility with pickup trucks in the last few years because in full-size trucks and it's starting to creep into the mid-size trucks as well, the utility is just great. Nissan, for example, great idea on their Titan pickup. They've used this wasted area here behind the wheels for a toolbox so you can store things like your cargo tie downs, booster cables which can have battery acid and gunge on them that you don't want to get inside the vehicle. Great idea and it even locks. I love it. Now when we get back to the cargo area, lots of good things happening back here too. Lockable tailgates, protection strips for the tops of the box already built in so you don't have to go and buy one of those chintzy looking plastic box liners and put it in your thirty or forty thousand dollar pickup truck. They've got the protection already there from the factory. Sprayed on box liners, you've got lights now in the pillars at the back here on the Titan and another one over here as well. And a neat thing on the Titan right here is a 12 volt power outlet so that you can use things like a work light in, on your uh, tailgate at night if you're doing service calls or repairs in the dark. Fantastic. Also, tie downs have really improved. You've got some low level tie downs. And on this particular truck, they've even got a strip here in the floor of the bed that you can slide attachments into and they'll lock in certain positions so you could tie something heavy like say a Harley motorcycle if you wanted to put that in the bed you could tie it down securely the way you need to. There's great great strides have been made. I'll tell you one thing though that I'd really like to see uh, the horsepower race obviously is, is alive and well in full-size pickups and that's great but you know what it's hurting fuel economy so much that I'd kind of like to see somebody come out with maybe a smaller displacement engine that got better fuel miles. Now Toyota's got a great idea on, on the Tundra this year. They've gone to um, variable valve timing so they've been able to increase the power in the engine without hurting the fuel economy and they go with a 4.7 liter V8 so they get pretty good fuel economy on the highway. Everybody else seems to be going with bigger and bigger V8s, high horsepower ratings but not great fuel economy. Till next week, I'm Bill Gardner for Motoring 2005.
regular viewers will know me and SUVs, stupid, ugly vehicles. They're overweight, they're under-talented, and they're over here. They ride and handle like crap, they have a disturbing tendency to fall over, and of course they suck fuel like it's going out of style, which of course it is. Now the reason most people like SUVs, frankly, let's get down to the basic facts, they hope their friends will think they own a horse farm in the country. Now I'm not just picking on Jeep here because they're all the same. But the fact is, there are maybe two advantages to an SUV. One is towing capacity. If you've got to haul a big trailer, you need the bulk. And a lot of people also like the tall seating position. You can see over other traffic. But if everybody's driving an SUV, there goes that advantage. So it seems to me that if you could come up with a vehicle that has a decent seating position, has an image that's a little bit nicer than a minivan, but has some practicality to it, you might have a winner. Well, check this puppy out. That's a Ford Freestyle. Looks like an Explorer, but it's lower to the ground. It costs less. It weighs a whole bunch less. Rides and handles better because it's basically built on a Volvo platform. It's got more room in it than an Explorer. Seats more people. It's more comfortable, more fuel efficient, handles better, rides better. What's wrong with this picture? Nothing that I can see. And Ford isn't the only one. Just about everybody's coming up with a vehicle like this. And why not? It makes a whole lot of sense. And if it means that you have to change your lifestyle, well, maybe that's a good thing. I'm Jim Kenzie. I haven't had a chance to get behind the wheel of the new M5, but Graham was there for the launch and he was impressed. And you know it won't be long before Graham is thrashing that new M5 around on the skid pads. And so make sure you join us for that. Now, before we go, just want to remind you that our Car of the Year program is quickly approaching and you too can cast a vote on our nominees for the best of 05. So why don't you log on to www.motoringtv.com or tsn.ca and cast your vote. That's it for now. We'll see you next time out as we continue to bring you more stories about cars and the people who drive them. Uh, they got such a style about them. They're not boxy looking. Uh, I don't know. I've always just thought they uh, have a good styling and something that's irreplaceable, but I think people would definitely buy them. They're sharp looking cars. TSN's Motoring 2005 has been brought to you by Quaker State Motor Oil, oils fine-tuned for different engines, and Midas, Total Car Care, we do that.